just a very quick bit about myself. I'm a, a friend of the Fusiliers Museum. I've uh, I've got no huge experience of Gallipoli, and I've I live in Leamington. And I, to my shame, I don't really know a vast amount about uh, Warwick. So um, when we do take questions, then please do keep that in mind, and we'll endeavour to answer our questions. But uh, please forgive us if there's any partial knowledge. Uh, I'm going to be spending about the, the next hour or so, maybe a little bit longer, uh, talking to you about uh, Warwick and its connection with Gallipoli. So uh, we'll crack on with that. Uh, as Ian mentioned, it's a virtual tour. Um, uh, we'll be doing some uh, Gallipoli overview very briefly, look at the connection between Gallipoli and Warwick. Uh, and part of that will be the tour where we'll walk around Warwick together uh, uh, for about 45 minutes. Then I'll give you some further information. And at that stage, I could I take or attempt to answer any questions that you may have. Although Ian will almost certainly have to dive in to help me if there's anything too specific about Gallipoli. Uh, so, um, the original plan for this was to generate some money for the uh, Fusilier Museum and doing that by doing a walk around the lovely town of Warwick um, for free, but the idea would be to ask for some donations at the end, which would go into the museum's coffers. Uh, obviously, um, uh, COVID-19 has put pay to that, so Ian came up with the idea a few months ago about doing a virtual tour instead, seeing as how how much of our life is now lived uh, through our computer screens, it seemed like a very good idea. So uh, this is the result of it. Uh, and what do we mean by um, a virtual tour? Well, it's basically just a multimedia presentation uh, using some uh, imagery, some videos, old photographs, new maps, old maps, and a couple of presentations as well to uh, give some context to what we, see, what we would see as we walk around Warwick. Uh, obviously, a big limitation that I'd love to show you around Warwick because it's a it's a it's a it's a charming uh, ch charming town to those of you who don't know it, um, and so it's a great shame we can't go around the town it as ourselves. However, there are quite a few opportunities that we can add by making it virtual. Uh, we can add content where it's most appropriate, and also we can jump around the town to make sure the story is coherent rather than backtracking on ourselves too much, which obviously be would become distracting for real. Uh, now for our first presentation, because I realise that not everybody knows a vast amount about Gallipoli, we're going to use our resident expert in Binny, who's going to give a, who's uh, gave the excellent talk that we've just enjoyed for the last hour and with his hat of the uh, Education Development Officer for the Gallipoli Association, uh, he's going to give us a 10 to 15 minute uh, overview of what the Gallipoli campaign involved. Um, so first of all, where is Gallipoli? There's a map of it, um, as you see, and the Gallipoli Peninsula uh, marked there, and the Sea of Mamara, and the uh, Dardanelles, the channel, the Dardanelles leading into the Sea of Mamala, and you have the Turkish capital, uh, Constantinople, and that was the Allied objective. You see the Black Sea, and uh, north of the Black Sea, you see uh, a route to uh, Russia, uh, one of the Allies. Um, so the main events of the Gallipoli campaign, initially it was a naval attack, it was uh, meant to be purely that, and uh, a hope to uh, knock Turkey out of the war by bombarding that capital we've just seen, Constantinople. But in the end, the Allied forces had to land at Helles and Anzac, and eventually at Suvla. Um, they tried to break out from those, failed, and then there was uh, a, uh, an additional landing in Suvla, uh, which led to the August offensives. There was a last major offensive on August the 21st, which was very unsuccessful, and the culmination of uh, that failure and uh, other events led to the evacuation uh, of Allied forces, uh, and therefore a Turkish victory. Um, so the uh, strategy 
uh, as I said, initially a naval attack. Uh, it was a victory back in London and in Paris for the Easterners who thought they could win the war elsewhere beside the Western Front. Uh, they could then knock out, uh, they planned to knock Turkey out of the war by simply bombarding Constantinople and Turkey um, being a prop of Germany uh, would then surrender and that would then lead to other props, for example, Bulgaria um, also being defeated. And there was a, also an element to providing an easier supply route to Russia. Could it ever have succeeded? Probably not with the amount of resources that were put into it. Uh, and that's been a, an ongoing view of historians and politicians uh, that it would never have succeeded with the uh, amount that was put into the campaign. So uh, talking about the first Turkish victory, because overall it was a, uh, a Turkish victory, of course, two large scale naval attacks on those dates that I put there, uh, both failed uh, because the Allied ships were damaged or sunk, a number of Allied ships were damaged or sunk by hitting mines. The Turkish shore guns um, either side of the Dardanelles prevented mine sweeping by the Allies and eventually the decision was made to land the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force um, to nullify those guns. Uh, and Sir Ian Hamilton, who had a very good track record, had been very successful in the Boer War, uh, he was put in charge. And to start with, it was just that was the limit of the objective um, to, um, uh, to uh, nullify those shore guns. But as often happens, there was a great deal of mission creep. creep rather. Uh, but of course, uh, while all this was going on, the Turks had plenty of time to prepare. And the Turkish view, of course, a great victory, rightly so, celebrated on the 18th of March rather than on Anzac Day, April the 25th, um, because of Turks who manned the guns and defeated the Allied naval attack. Um, and before we look in a little bit more detail who was there, not just the Australians, um, it's often associated with Australian and New Zealanders, rightfully so, um, because it's very important in their culture. But the majority of the um, half a million or so troops there were British Irish, uh, with a strong con uh, contingent from other parts of the empire. We tend also to forget the French. Uh, there was about 50,000 French troops there. They also forget it. The French forget it. It's virtually unknown in modern day France, uh, the Dardanelles. Uh, the first divisions that were involved were uh, regular divisions, um, but then um, the, as I spoke of mission creep, uh, more and more divisions were put in uh, by particularly the British, including newly formed Kitchener divisions. So the landings, uh, the, uh, it was a successful, whatever we might think of the outcome of the, um, the Gallipoli campaign, uh, the, it was a successful um, amphibious landing in the face on two of the beaches, uh, V Beach and W Beach at the southern tip called Hellas, uh, in the face of very fierce resistance. Um, as I said there, very heavy resistance on two of the British beaches and the Lancashire Fusiliers won six VCs, uh, said before breakfast, early in the morning on W Beach. Uh, three other beaches, um, very light casualties, but as often happened in this campaign, um, uh, lost the opportunity to exploit the success. The, um, the uh, troops who landed on the other beaches didn't push on to help those struggling at both V Beach and W Beach. Um, but the two Warwickshire regiments, the Yeomanry and the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, were not involved at this stage. And there's a map of the peninsula. You see Hellas down at the bottom there, the, um, the uh, southern end of the Gallipoli Peninsula, the Dardanelles is the, um, the strip of water between them. There, Achibaba, you can just make out, is the, um, is the uh, objective for the first day. Uh, the Allies got nowhere near it. You see the line drawn there, um, south of Krithia, that's as far as they got. We'll be talking about Suvla Bay and Anzac in a moment. Um, 
very famous painting there um, of V Beach uh, when they landed um, a, a lot of British and Irish regiments, a number of British and Irish regiments landed, or battalions rather, landed uh, from uh, uh, the SS River Clyde. Uh, the Anzac landings, they didn't fare too well either, um, basically um, because they landed too far north and ended up in very, very difficult campaign. Um, it uh, really was uh, the Dardanelles was a series of one natural fortress after another. The troops became entangled. They took many hours before they were able to uh, move haphazardly towards their objectives. By that time, the Turks had uh, uh, organized their resistance under uh, one particularly very good general, Mustafa Kemal, who became Kemal Ataturk, the father of modern day Turkey, organized fierce resistance and uh, counterattacks, and uh, so much so uh, that at one time Birdwood, the uh, Australian uh, general, uh, contemplated evacuating, but they hung on, but they were always hemmed in in a very, very small beachhead. And there's a painting of them arriving. See the naval support. Naval support wasn't always particularly effective. Naval gunnery was not always effective. So unfortunately for the Allies, fortunately for the Turks, it um, developed into stalemate, very similar stalemate uh, in uh, that you'll find uh, on the Western Front. Um, the both sides facing each other across no man's land and a line of trenches. Costly battles at, um, uh, at that southern end at Hellas, Krithia and Gully Ravine. 9th Battalion Royal Welsh Regiment were involved in these. Often these allied assaults badly planned, badly carried out, inadequate artillery support. Many of the divisions that arrived over the period of time didn't have their artillery with them. Um, because there wasn't room to deploy them and there was an over-reliance on, uh, on uh, naval bombardment which was very ineffective at times. The Anzacs, as I said, <laughs> hemmed into one and a half mile beachhead, huge um, uh, mountainous terrain uh, to try and, um, to try and uh, capture um, but, and they failed. The Turks, of course, um, uh, they counterattacked and suffered heavy casualties as well. It just wasn't the Allies suffering heavy, heavy casualties, it was the, uh, the Turks as well. And uh, a familiar picture, there's a picture of uh, the aftermath of an attack on the Turkish trench lines by the Allies across the flat, um, the flat land approaching. You can see Krithia in the distance, the trees in the distance, but they uh, failed to capture that, which was one of the objectives on the first day. So the Sovla landings, Hamilton, uh, to his credit, tried a new landing uh, uh, further north behind the Turks of Sovla Bay, catching them by surprise. Uh, they were virtually unopposed. There were some casualties um, from snipers and desultory uh, artillery fire, uh, but virtually unopposed. But again, poor leadership uh, meant uh, the opportunities were lost. Um, uh, General Stopford in charge of the Ninth Corps, um, which was the, um, the unit uh, that landed in Suvla, really failed um, to uh, make the most of an opportunity of landing behind the Turks and catching them by surprise. And in the end, it became the same depressing um, grinding attritional battle to capture the high ground where they're surrounded by and the Warwickshire Yeomanry were involved in those initial attacks and there's a picture which really sums it up that's a, not a picture of an army forcing their way inland um, they because of lack of orders and confusion at the top leadership really was very poor they really failed to um, to move on and make the most of the, um, the opportunity that they found themselves with. Um, supporting the Suva landings, the large scale offensives from both Hellas and uh, from Suvla. Um, and um, uh, there was some success at Gully Ravine, but again, similar picture attacks on trenches, um, not supported enough with artillery, leading to heavy casualties. Uh, in the north, Allied troops. 
cooperating, uh, the 9th Battalion Royal Welsh Regiment, cooperating with the Anzacs, uh, managed to seize part of the main mountain uh, range, Chenock Bear, and could look down onto the Dardanelles, uh, a real objective, uh, but they were driven off with heavy casualties. And uh, despite the limited success, casualties very, very high and little changed. Um, Hamilton, tired of his officers, um, they were foisted on him. They weren't hand-picked. And six of them, including Stockford and Hunter Weston, um, who has a reputation as being one of the most incompetent generals of, the, uh, of uh, World War I, uh, were dismissed. He then chose to launch one major offensive, uh, which on the Suva front on the 21st of August, again, futile, badly coordinated attack, leading to very heavy casualties. Uh, Hamilton was replaced soon after, and his military career ended. And then we ended up with a, uh, a very unpleasant deadlock, um, very similar to that on the Western Front. Um, by that time, Allied politicians tiring of the campaign, they'd put more and more Kitchener, had put more and more British troops in, agreed to send in more and more divisions without success. Some of these divisions were removed and sent to Salonika. Uh, casualties, despite the fact uh, the campaign was petering to an end, uh, continued to mount in the usual way in trench warfare. Uh, disease was rife, particularly dysentery. Uh, for example, Clement Attlee served there um, in the Manchesters, uh, and he suffered uh, very badly from dysentery, but recovered to be one of the last people ever, the last soldiers rather, ever taken off. And both of the regiments, the Yeomanry and the Royal Wiltshire Regiment, uh, suffered, the 9th Battalion, suffered hard, continuous casualties in this period. And there's a picture of uh, this sort of trench warfare that we're familiar with with the Western Front and was replicated uh, very much so at Gallipoli. Um, ironically, um, the best managed aspect of the campaign was uh, the departure, uh, evacuating, caught the Turks by surprise. Some apologists for Gallipoli um, thinking seemed to be believe that justified the whole campaign. Uh, I can't agree with them. Um, it's an evacuation isn't a victory. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Suvla and Anzac in the north evacuated in December. Helles finally in January. There were no Allied casualties. So it was a, a major achievement. No Allied casualties in that uh, evacuation. But masses of equipment was left behind. Much of it um, deliberately blown up. Uh, made unserviceable, and sadly hundreds of horses, if not thousands of horses and mules, were slaughtered as well. So no way round it, it was a, uh, a strategic defeat for the Allies. Ian, thank you very much indeed. I mean, that's uh, for such a complicated campaign to have an introduction uh, to it, to cover it in 15 minutes, I think is excellent, so thank you very much. Uh, Please remember two of the units that Ian uh, mentioned in that. The, uh, there's the uh, first Warwickshire Yeomanry and also the 9th Battalion of the Royal uh, Warwickshire Regiment. And we're going to be coming back to those in due course. But now I'd like to transport us back from the Dardanelles to Warwick and we'll just orientate ourselves around Warwick. Uh, for those of you who have not visited Warwick, it's a fantastic place to visit, and this is literally a quick flying visit uh, to show you the layout. And for those of you who live there, you might not have seen this viewpoint before. So there's Warwick in the Midlands. Uh, the most famous part of it is the castle, which sits just above the River Avon. To the north of it is Priory Park, and the main part of the city, of the town, runs from Eastgate along Jury Street to Westgate and the world famous Lord Leicester Hospital. Out to the west of that you have the race course and then further west little village of Hampton Magna. There's the bypass the A46 and the new development of Woodlows Park greatly ex expands it. Lemon Spa out to the east, 
with the canal and railway line running through. If we zoom in a little bit now, and the, this will show you the medieval part of Warwick, which is effectively in the foreground now. It's on a hill and it's been uh, populated for thousands of years and Warwick itself uh, first set about, about 900 AD. We're now going to come just to the east of the, uh, the town and to our first location, and that is St John's House. This is where we're going to start our tour. Uh, St, uh, St John's House, it was uh, created by William de Beaumont, who was the Earl of Warwick, and the aim of it is to help the local uh, poor and ill and to provide casual overnight board and lodging for impoverished travellers such as pilgrims. The current house dates from 1666 and is in the Jacobean style, but other parts are a bit older than that. Sometimes it's been a private residence, but for a large part of its history, it's been connected with caring or providing for the local community. Uh, it's currently home of the, Royal, uh, the Fusilier Museum, and Stephanie Bennett, the curator of the museum, uh, will now describe the workings of the, de of the museum in detail. Thank you for your interest in the museum. So, what is the museum and what does it do? Most of you will know that the full title is the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers Museum, bracket Royal Warwickshire. The shorter title is the Fusilier Museum Warwick. The museum is currently located at St John's House, which it moved to in 1961 from Budbrook Barracks near Warwick. It tells the story of the County Infantry Regiment from 1674 to the Fusiliers of today. It is the spiritual home of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. During the First World War, 47,500 men served in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. Many new battalions were created for the war effort. Some battalions of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment went to the front and others trained men in England to fight overseas. Over 11,500 men died from the regiment in the conflict. So where did the Warwicks fight in World War I? The Royal Warwickshire Regiment fought in several different theatres of war. This included the 9th Battalion in Gallipoli before going to Mesopotamia. The 9th Battalion is unique as it was the only battalion of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment to fight in Gallipoli. The other battalions were in Europe, on the Western Front, in France, Belgium and Italy. So they fought in the major battles of the Somme and Ypres as well as others. Field Marshals Slim and Montgomery both served with the regiment in World War I. Slim was injured in Gallipoli and Montgomery was very badly wounded in October 1914. Both officers went on to play a very important role in World War II. There are 13,000 objects in the regimental collection. Some of them show the historical link between the county and the regiment. This may be soldiers being born in the, and living in the area, it may also be photographs of where the regiment was based, such as at Badbrook, Budbrook Barracks, which is now Hampton Magna Housing Estate. Unfortunately, the museum does not have that many objects relating to Gallipoli and the Knight Battalion. In this display case, you can see Lieutenant Slim's revolver, which he used at Gallipoli, and the luggage label used on the ship that took him back to England to recover after being wounded. Looking ahead, the future of the museum, it is currently closed due to COVID um, and also preparing to move to Pageant House on Jury Street, which is a, a more central location in Warwick. In the new museum, there will be the opportunity to 
discover exciting new displays. It is anticipated that the museum will reopen probably in, in March 2022. But do look out for updates during the year to see what to find out what's happening. The museum can still be contacted about family history research, the shop, and there will be an outdoor event at St John's House on Saturday the 17th of July, COVID restrictions permitting. You can also support the museum by becoming a volunteer, joining the Friends organisation and donating to the, the museum via the website or on the GoFundMe site. You can also follow the museum on social media. We have Facebook and Twitter pages. For more information about the museum, please also see our website. Thank you for listening. Stephanie, thank you very much. As well as being for the time being, as Stephanie said, uh, housing the Fusiliers Museum, uh, it goes back before the First World War, St John's was also the headquarters for the Warwickshire Yeomanry. And that's one of the units that uh, Ian Benny mentioned in his uh, Glibly video. We're going to learn about a bit about this video, about this regiment now. Uh, so who were the Yeomanry? Uh, this comes back to the medieval concept of farmers following their lords into battle. Uh, they were created again, uh, to defend against French invasion during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and then used to keep the peace and quell riots, think about Peterloo, and also to escort the condemned to the gallows, and they did that at Warwick. They had to provide their own horses, uh, but uniforms and weapons were provided from local subscription. Turn of the, the previous century, uh, the Boer War saw need for mounted infantry in South Africa, and here you see a depiction of the uh, of of uh, the yeomanry being used not as cavalry but as mounted infantry. After the war, the uh, re um, reforms saw that the saw the yeomanry become part of the territorial associations. Uh, we are now going to take uh, start our walking tour, uh, and we're going to meet a yeoman in 1914. So from St John's House, we're going to walk westwards back towards the uh, back towards the town and that's what it would have looked like in 1914 and we're not going very far on this it's uh, only about 150 meters towards the town center and then we're going to be stopping so just into smith street one of the main commercial streets in warwick and here's ian Biddy again behind me is 51 smith street home of William and Alice Beach. Their son, William Garfield, was born in 1884. The 1911 census shows him living here on his own and he was a butcher. He was also a member of the 1st Warwickshire Yeomanry, B Squadron, a part-time soldier who had enlisted for four years and did 15 days of camp. So why would people like William Garfield Beach volunteer for the Yeomanry? Uh, a bit of comradeship maybe, a bit of excitement if you're a, a poor working man, uh, and also fitted in uh, pretty well with the Edwardian culture, which is a lot more militaristic than, uh, we, than we see today. Um, the regular armies looked down on the territorial force and the Yeomanry, uh, but their job was to uh, defend the UK if the regular army had to deploy. So here you can see them out on their camps, their, their annual camp. And very much like today's TA. As part of his duties, uh, William Beach would have had to keep this booklet in the top of the pocket of his tunic. And that was uh, uh, worth reading this, that the NCOs and men on receipt of Army Form E635 or on reading any proclamation calling out the territorial force, every NCO and man will immediately prepare himself to join his squadron at squadron headquarters 
by 3 p.m. on the day following. The dress is going to be service, uh, service jacket, cap and leggings, brown boots and spurs, uh, also shoulder and waist bandoliers, cloak, rifle and, sal and saddlery. Kit, toilet necessities, one complete change of underclothing, one knife, spoon and fork, grooming kit. Weight allowed by regulations, 25 pounds per man. And in the summer of uh, 1914, uh, home rule uh, 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 for Ireland, not war with Germany, would have seen the main threat to uh, people in the, in the UK. Uh, events really sprang, sprang out of control on the August bank holiday of 4th of August, and the mobilised telegram was duly sent out. Uh, this little video now is going to follow William Beach uh, on the journey he would have made once he received that notification of uh, mobilisation. On 5th of August 1914 at William Garfield Beach, now private, 2161 Beach, uh, would have walked down here uh, with his kit uh, to spend four days here at B Squadron Drill Hall. He would have gone to collect horses and train, begin his training in St Nicholas Park. So once the squadron had prepared at local level, then its regiment was concentrated as the four squadrons joined to form the complete regiment. Our tour follows the 300 odd civilians as they turn themselves into a wartime military unit. We're now going to re retrace our steps back up to Smith Street, under the medieval uh, East Gate, and then turn into the Butts. And you can see, as well as the video, you can see the little red arrow showing us the path that we'd be going to be taking through Warwick. Several British towns and cities have streets uh, named Butts, and that comes from the medieval laws requiring Englishmen to practice archery. Uh, the Butts was a mound behind the target. Uh, and these towns and cities were put in a safe place uh, to avoid obvious uh, dangers. In Warwick, this, the butts were running along the town wall, uh, so hence why the uh, name has stuck. We're going to follow B Squadron's footsteps up the butts on, on the 10th of August, as Ian Benny will explain. On the 10th of August 1914, the four squadrons of the 1st 1st Warwickshire Yeomanry concentrated in the town. As we've seen, B Squadron were already in Warwick. You can see them here now. The other squadrons uh, joined them. B Squadron from Birmingham, C Squadron from Coventry, and D Squadron from Stratford on Avon. Together they got ready to go to war. And we're now going to follow uh, the Yemri as they continued that journey of concentration. From the butts, they headed, they headed north up the butts, then just around the corner into the market square. Again, this is all on the 10th of August, and there you see an aerial photo from the approximately 1914. Uh, this is Market Square, uh, where the regiment gathered. Uh, you can see them here on the photograph on the 10th of August, 1914. The fountain is no longer here, but behind me you can see uh, the museum, which was then the Market Hall. Regular regiments only had three squadrons, so a squadron was merged in with the other three. The newly constituted regiment set off for Shire Hall. Two days later, the majority of the soldiers volunteered for overseas service. So we've seen so far that uh, the yeomanry were mobilised on the 5th, 
concentrated on the 10th. And then on, uh, from there, they uh, went out to the park to uh, train. And then 5th, 13th of August, they boarded trains for East Anglia, where they were brigaded with other yeomanry outfits at uh, Bury St Edmunds. And the yeomanry, of course, uh, they were a volunteer unit um, and uh, a cavalry unit. There they are on parade. They expected to uh, fight the Germans uh, when they all volunteered for overseas service. Uh, that is them later on, not at Gallipoli. That's how, even though they were going off to the Middle East um, to fight the Turks, that's how they thought they would uh, be fighting. Um, but they didn't, and I'll come back to that. They formed part of the 2nd Mounted Division under Major General William E. Payton. It was an infantryman, which was uh, useful, as we'll find out in a moment. They also sailed from Avonmouth and arrived at Suvla on the night of 17th and 18th of August, going via e Alexandria and then Mudros. And that's what the, uh, a a cartoon version but very realistic as they ended up fighting on foot which is why it was perhaps better that they had a an infantry um, general in charge and uh, there's a picture um, uh, a rare picture of them actually on the beach at Suvla and uh, you see there at uh, Suvla I'll mention the Salt Lake in a moment Chocolate Hill and Simit Scimitar Hill, both names that are really etched into the psyche of the uh, yeomanry. Um, so on the 21st of August, I've already mentioned that attack, that uh, futile attack, they uh, were ordered to support it. It already had um, uh, other units had suffered very severe casualties from Lalababa across that salt plain to Chocolate Hill. And they were then to go from Chocolate Hill to attack Scimitar Hill. A Turkish artillery officer said that it presented, they presented uh, a target such as artillery men thought impossible outside the world of their dreams. The second mounted division walking slowly, marching slowly on foot across that salt plain. On reaching Chocolate Hill, um, they then continued towards Scimitar Hill and another position called Hill 112. Um, they were thrown into attack uh, without having any chance to reconnoitre or gather their reserves. Uh, part of the hill was captured, um, but the surviving yeomanry came under very heavy fire from the Turks. Remember, the Turks were always above them, and uh, by the time they were drawn, withdrawn to Lanababa, they had suffered severe casualties. Uh, they went, uh, saw service in the trenches and then evacuated in December 1915, but survived as a unit and went on to serve with great distinction in uh, the Middle East. And that's a photo by Kate and Woodville of the attack on Scimitar Hill. It doesn't show the yeomanry, uh, but shows uh, British troops attacking. And one feature of this attack was the gorse caught fire, um, burning the wounded. Um, and uh, there is a, a famous picture of the Second Mounted Division crossing the Salt Lake. You see Chocolate Hill and then Scimitar Hill in the distance, but how, uh, what an open target they were. Uh, there's an actual photograph. It isn't actually the uh, uh, Warwickshire Yeomanry, it's another Yeomanry regiment crossing the Salt Flats. And unfortunately, uh, the result was very, very heavy casualties. And there you see a, an ambulance unit. Um, so just to read two extracts um, about this, um, the involvement of the Warwickshire Yeomanry in this uh, attack. One is by Philip Campion, and he wrote this description of the battle in 1919 when he had fortunately survived. On the 21st of August, there was another great offensive to drive back the Turk. It was our duty to march from the coast to part of the line in front of Chocolate Hill. To get there, the route lay across a dry salt lake, absolutely open country. We were indeed meant to draw off the enemy's fire from the front line. I'm not sure that was part of the plan. They suspected it was, that they, they were thrown in 
creates such an easy target that the Turks would take, um, would switch attention from other attackers. I don't think that actually happened. At three o'clock, we set off, three o'clock in the afternoon, that is. The whole of the Warwickshire Yeomanry leading the way, line of troops, columns, a splendid target. Their guns let us have it about half a mile, then the fun began. A terrific barrage of shrapnel was put up, which seemed impossible to get through alive. Our comrades were falling all around us. Two miles of this, then those that remained gained the first sheltered chocolate hill. The roll call and breathing time before the next advance. But they were, of course, thrown quickly into the next attack with very little breathing time. Uh, the Tate letter, this letter was published in the Midland Daily Telegraph on the 1st of 11th of October 1915, written by Sergeant Major Tate. Um, and whoever he sent it to, um, the letter to, uh, sent it to the newspaper. And he writes, the attack of the Warwickshire Yeomanry was made across three and a half miles of open plain commanded by the enemy's artillery. At first, the shells began to burst in singles, then in threes and fours, then in dozens, and were in the thick of it. Men began to fall on all sides, some wounded, some killed. We kept on, however, and at three quarters of a mile of marching, we found ourselves at the bottom of the hill. We threw ourselves on the ground out of sheer exhaustion, for you must remember being taken straight from our horses and put on our feet. I cannot tell you what my feelings were coming across. All I know, I saw my comrades falling all about me and expected to go down at any moment. And I remember nothing more until I found myself on the hill and not wounded. I started out with 147 men and 95 answered the roll. And then the full meaning of war came to me. I'm not ashamed to say I cried like a baby and I was not the only one. Some of my best friends had gone. It's a very sad recollection there of the battle. And there's a, a picture from the um, museum, from the Warwickshire Yeomanry Museum of the Yeomanry in the trenches. Uh, as I said, they'd expected to go into battle on their horses. Um, that didn't happen. And uh, that is it. Powerful stuff. Thank you, Ian. So, to uh, continue the uh, Yeomanry story then, as you've heard, uh, they were evacuated, um, they landed, they said as uh, infantry at Gallipoli, and what we're going to do is just now use a bit of Google Earth just to follow that landing that Ian has described so, uh, so dramatically. You can see Dardanelles, you can see this very, very much bears up onto the map that uh, Ian showed you. So they are landing on A Beach, and you can see just ahead, Chocolate Hill, uh, Green Hill, Scimitar Hill, and in the distance, Chunuk Bear. And this is the path they would have followed across the Salt Lake, uh, where they were shelled so badly, uh, and then the fighting that, they, that took place as they moved from Chocolate Hill up to Green Hill, and you can see Scimitar Hill up along the ridge in the distance. They landed with 308 men. Uh, only 15 other ranks were killed, but uh, unfortunately one of those was William Beach, who we saw earlier. Uh, we've got no photograph of him, so all that remains is the, uh, his casualty card, which just said he was killed in action on August the 31st. Once they were evacuated they, uh, from Gallipoli, they went to uh, Palestine, as, where they served as cavalry this time, with great distinction. Uh, and but by January of 1918, they were back on the Western Front and had swapped their horses for machine guns, uh, a reflection of the changing nature of warfare. And uh, if you want to see any more about this, then strongly recommend the uh, Yeomanry Museum. And uh, Philip Wilson has been very, very helpful with all the information he's given on that.
Uh, now, just to finish uh, the uh, Yeomanry tour, we're going to head out of the Market Square, turn left down Swan Street. Down to High Street and then uh, turn left to the junction with uh, Church Street and Courthouse. And uh, that building you see just on the far side of the, uh, the junction is Church House and beneath that is the, uh, um, the, the Warwickshire Yeomanry Museum. Now we're going to consider the other military units from Warwickshire who was involved at Gallipoli. And that's the 9th War Warwicks. Uh, the Royal Warwickshire Regiment was initially raised to, to fight uh, as mercenaries in, in Holland. Uh, it fought many campaigns uh, throughout the years, uh, Battle of the Boyne, the American War of Independence, the Peninsula campaigns, for example. Uh, in the 18th century, reforms linked the regiment to Warwickshire and uh, hence the, uh, the, you see Warwickshire on its uh, length there. They, did, they spent plenty of time out and about on the empire, uh, defending the empire and acting effectively as a colonial police force. Uh, after 1908, they are in the standard uh, formation. No, excuse me. Just go back. So by, the, uh, by 1908, after the uh, reforms of the Boer War, they were very much a standard, very senior regiment, uh, having uh, two battalions of regulars, one of whom would be at home, another one overseas, defending the empire. Uh, it would have two special reserve battalions back in the UK and four battalions of territorials, part-time soldiers, very much like the yeomanry were. However, uh, when war came, and this is where we fit into the Ninth Royal Warwicks, uh, approximately 500,000 men joined the British Army between the 4th of August and the 12th of September 1914. They had to go somewhere, so uh, answering Kitchener's call, they, uh, they, be, they formed a new army. So they're going to become service soldiers uh, to serve for the duration of war or for three years. And uh, the Ninth Service Battalion was one of the first Kitchener Army brigade, uh, battalions, part of the 39th Brigade of the 13th Western Division. We're now going to take a short walk to meet one of them. And uh, that is literally just down the road. And we're going to uh, have uh, a talk from the great niece of Second Lieutenant Alfred Kemp, that's uh, Juliet Homer who's going to give us this video talk. My name is Juliet Homer. My great uncle, Alfred G. Kemp, was a second lieutenant in the 9th Battalion of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. And at the age of 28, he was killed in action on the 10th of August, 1915, at the Battle of Sari Bear, Gallipoli. At the time, his parents, Thomas and Emily Kemp, my great grandparents, were living in this house, number 10, Jury Street. He also left behind his brother Cuthbert and his sister Nancy, who was my grandmother. Educated at Warwick School, where his name is on the memorial board in Chapel, as well as the memorial in Church Street here in Warwick, his obituary describes him as one of the most dashing and popular officers of the battalion. His name is listed on the Helles Memorial in Turkey. Thank you very much, Juliet. And uh, from one of the officers, we're now going to go to the other end of town and uh, meet somebody else, also at the 9th Royal Warwicks. So, tracing, retracing our steps, from Jury Street, we're going to head west along High Street, past the uh, Westgate and Lord Leicester, all the way down to West Street. Number 91, and Ian Binney is going to take up the story there.
This is 91 West Street, home of Percy Hutchison Reader, now part, as you see, of the Charter House Bed and Breakfast. Uh, Percy was born here in October 1895. The 1911 census shows him living here and working for the Daimler Company. He volunteered, as did many, uh, for the 9th Warwickshire Regiment, uh, uh, for obviously answering Kitchener's call. Uh, we have no record of this because, unfortunately, the records were destroyed in the Blitz in 1940. Um, the 9th Service Battalion, uh, Royal Warwickshire Regiment, um, that was uh, the only battalion of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment that was present during Gallipoli, uh, joined the 39th Brigade of the 13th Western Division and uh, went via uh, Avonmouth, as many of the units did, uh, via Mudros or Lemnos, uh, and Mudros in the case of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, landed in Helles, spending two weeks in the trenches. A difficult two weeks, quite heavy casualties, even though it was uh, almost all quiet on the Helles front. And the CO, Colonel Palmer, uh, was killed by a Turkish sniper. The battalion was drawn to Lemnos and then they landed at Anzac Cove uh, to support uh, the Anzac attack in support of the Suvra landings. Uh, they took part in the attack on Seri Bear, managed to get close to the summit, um, close some of them, as I said, managed to look down onto the Dardanelles over the other side, but they were driven back. Um, and they spent a very, very uncomfortable time in uh, an area called the farm under continuous Turkish fire, um, being attacked um, continually and uh, shot at continuously. They suffered so many casualties, there were no officers left, only 288 other ranks left, and they were taken back to and put in reserve. Um, and like many of these regiments in this um, downtime, if you can call it that, in the Gallipoli campaign, they alternated be between being in reserve and serving in the trenches. But even during the quiet times, casualties steadily increased. And as the weather got worse, many soldiers succumbed to illness and transferred to Suvla again. Um, and then fell victim, as many units did, to a terrible storm in the area. Um, and I'll read you some of the war diary in a moment, uh, with um, trenches literally being washed away. And then followed, um, uh, to add to the discomfiture of the soldiers, uh, by a tremendous blizzard. And some soldiers actually died from exposure. They were moved to Hellas again, and even in that period, as they were starting to pack up, suffered casualties, um, ongoing casualties. And uh, there is a map uh, showing uh, the area uh, that, they, um, that they were fighting on. You can see Sari Bar, uh, and they got virtually to the top of that, but you see the area, uh, the farm uh, there. So the war diaries, I'm going to read three extracts from the war diaries um, that um, firstly, the 10th of August 1915. Uh, remember, this is whilst they were at the farm. Um, early in the morning, the Turks attacked our position with disastrous results for the Warwickshire Regiment. Uh, quite unusual for somebody to say that in a war diary. It was found impossible to hold the trenches with no supports available. The Gurkhas and Sikhs retired, the trenches were enfiladed by machine gun fire and our men were mown down. For the 27th of November, that's when they're on the Suvla front, it says, in the evening at around 6 p.m., a terrific thunderstorm came on, flooding the whole of our trenches completely, sweeping away all parapets and filling all dugouts, washing away kit, etc., and burying trench stores. This continued up to nearly midnight. And then I mentioned Hellas. Um, then um, they were back in the trenches at Hellas. Uh, 1st of December 1915, trenches occupied and parapets being repaired, but men in critical condition due to the cold. Some have died of exposure. 
and uh, an interesting picture. I'm sure it's a posed picture. That is, um, uh, um, the gentleman who become Field Marshal Slim, I think he's pretending to be asleep on duty uh, for the uh, purposes of the camera. And there's a, a rare photo of uh, the 9th Battalion in the trenches, uh, familiar, of course, um, uh, to anybody who knows about the Western Front. And again, quite a rare photo there. Um, I don't think that's Slim there scratching his helmet. Um, uh, a familiar photo, um, a sort of rare photo of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, the 9th Battalion. Thank you, Ian. So, as Ian said, uh, on the 9th of August, they made their assault on uh, Chunk Bear, and on the 10th of August, the Turks counterattacked. We're now going to visit uh, the, um, the path that the 9th Warwicks took. And you can see again, we're coming in, this time in through Anzac Cove, and just see the terrain, see how mountainous, see how far above um, the British, the Turks were. And this is where they made their assaults up onto Chunuk Bear. And if you look just at the top of the video there, you can see the Dardanelles tantalizingly close in the distance. However, they were forced back off that by the Turkish counterattacks to this area of the farm where they suffered such appalling casualties. Uh, they were open on both flanks and so had men, MG machine gun fire from either side. Uh, those four days that they were in action uh, cost them 416 casualties, half of those killed or missing, half wounded, and that's out of a nominal 800 men in the battalion. At the end of it, when they, were, they came off the hill, they were led by a sergeant major, every other officer being killed. Uh, we've already heard from uh, Juliet Homer that Alfred Kemp was killed uh, in that fighting. Unfortunately, so, too, so was uh, Percy Reader. Uh, but uh, just to give an idea of how the, uh, the regiment suffered, um, the, well, sorry, the division, 13th Division suffered, it had taken 5,500 casualties out of its landing strength of 10,500. Of the 13 battalion commanders, 10 of those were casualties. So this was appalling fighting and the conditions that, uh, as Ian mentioned, um, were appalling just to live in. So people were uh, much as, just as likely to become ill as they were to become wounded. Uh, but that wasn't the end of the Ninth Warwick's War. It got uh, quite interesting after that. They were sent to Mesopotamia. Uh, and uh, one of the world's uh, first world war's lesser known campaigns this was, this was run by the british army in india and what started as a quick uh, successful mission to secure the oil supply from the persian oil fields which are vital for the royal navy's dreadnoughts this turned into a classic uh, example of mission creep uh, and it was a sprawling wasteful conquest of what we now call iraq as we've already heard in uh, Ian's previous lecture today, the 9th Warwick's arrived in time to join the doomed uh, attempt to lift the Ottoman siege of Kut, uh, where the 6th Puna Division uh, were, were, had to surrender at the end of April. Um, the Royal Warwick's, after one month attempting to lift that siege, had 200 effective men out of 800. Uh, they were resupplied and reorganised over the winter uh, and then made the successful uh, assault on Baghdad and then even further up to Mosul. That's the same Mosul that uh, ISIS captured a few years ago. Mm. And one of the more bizarre campaigns of the First World War, uh, General Lionel Dunsterville, uh, uh, Dunster Force, uh, attempted to, de to defend the Armenian government from Ottoman and German uh, assault uh, in, up in this area, up by the Caspian Sea. Initially just 350 men, uh, these were then reinforced by the 39th Brigade, so hence the 9th World Worcesters, so 9th World Warwicks. Uh, and their job was to train the Armenian forces, but also to uh, help defend the oil fields around Baku. At the Battle of Baku, the uh, uh, 
the Armenians turn around and run away in the face of heavy Ottoman attacks. So Don's the force withdrew over the 14th and 15th of September of 1918. Uh, however, five uh, Warwickshire men um, called Tbilisi, that, uh, that corner of foreign fields, uh, one of the more uh, unheard of Commonwealth war graves. Uh, but now we're going to leave, uh, using the magic of uh, virtual tour, to leave uh, West Street to visit somewhere that uh, uh, all the volunteers, such as Alfred Kemp and Charles Reader, as well as regular old bills and territorials from 1916 would, uh, would know. And we're going to fly out to the west. And after the, uh, as, um, from West Street to Budbrook Barracks. After the Childers and Cardwell reforms in the late 19th century, uh, barracks sprang up all over the UK, uh, usually at a safe distance uh, outside homes um, to minimise the squad is disturbing the, uh, the, the good civilians. Uh, built very much to a same standard, uh, those at Budbrook uh, would have looked very similar to. Uh, to these pictures that we're showing now. Um, and you can see how where the parade square is in Hampton Magna now. Uh, got some photos of typical uh, barracks that built in 1877. As I said, these are not from Budbrook, but um, they could be equally well uh, the one uh, has been seen there and especially the keep at the center of it. Uh, they served as a home to the regiment when not on empire duty but also uh, the admin center for reservists and territorial troops and for processing the many hundreds of thousands of volunteers who flocked to the colors in the in the autumn of 1914 and we can see here uh, that top photo is indeed um, a, a selection of uh, volunteers in 1914 at Budbrook. However, uh, after the Second World War, uh, there was a huge reduction in the numbers of the armies and the bar a lot of the barracks fell into uh, disuse and disrepair. Uh, you can see uh, when it was closed in 1960, it didn't take long for the barracks to fall really uh, uh, into disrepair. And since then, they've been completely demolished and Hampton Magna has now sprung up in its place. So from Budbrook Barracks, we're now going to fly back into town. Just to conclude the tour. As we come across the race course, we're going to come to one of the major buildings in Warwick, and that's St Mary's Church, the collegiate church uh, in, in the town. And very lucky to be granted access, even during Covid, to the museum, uh, to the church, we're very grateful for them, um, because it's a quite remarkable building and with a close connection to the Warwickshire Regiment and also the Yeomanry as well. And uh, we've now got um, Lieutenant Colonel John Rice, who's Chairman of the Trustees, is going to give us a tour of the, the, uh, the church and in particular the regimental chapel. My name is Lieutenant Colonel John Rice. Uh, I'm a retired officer, having served previously in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment and more lately in its successor, 2nd Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. We're here in the Collegiate Church of St Mary's in, in the centre of Warwick, and behind me is the regimental chapel dedicated to the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. The chapel has been linked to the regiment for decades and decades, as evidenced by the memorial plates to past commanding officers and colonels of the regiment. But it was not until 1952 
that the chapel was formally dedicated to become the regimental chapel of the regiment. This church is the spiritual home of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment in its home county. It is an important place to remember. And of great importance, above my head, are the regimental colours. These are the heart and soul of any regiment, and the colours suspended in the ceiling behind me represent previous regiments and battalions of the Royal Warwick's items. So when they are first issued to a battalion, they are consecrated by a man of the church, and at the end of their useful life, which is normally 25 years, they are normally laid up in church, uh, suspended from the rafters, or otherwise displayed, where they there quietly decay over the decades. And a visitor to St. Mary's, to look at the colours behind me, will see this in action. Some of the older colours are becoming very, very threadbare, whilst the newer colours, those of the 2nd Battalion of the Fusiliers, which were laid up in 2016, are the latest and newest set of colours. Each regiment has two sets of colours. Firstly, you have the Sovereign's colour, <coughs> currently the Queen's colour. This is based on the Union flag, and embroidered on it are the names of those battles from the First and Second World Wars in which the regiment saw action. Then there is the regimental colour, and that records the actions and campaigns outside the two great wars in which the regiments serve. The colours are also a memorial to those who served in the regiment and who gave their lives in the service of Queen and Country. So therefore they are of huge importance and they are always treated with the most enormous respect from the sovereign downwards. And as an aside, if you watch the Trooping of the Colour, when the colours are marched past Her Majesty, if you watch carefully, you will note that she acknowledges their passing with a nod of the head. In addition to the colours behind me, a very special uh, item, again hanging from the wall, is the garter banner of the late Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery. Normally, uh, this would be laid up in Windsor Castle, where his funeral was, was held, but as his instruction and insistence, he decreed that it was to be hung in this church. And we're greatly honored to have that banner with us. Now, while of course the focus of memorials is very much on uh, the losses of the two great wars, we in the regiment do not lose sight of the fact that many soldiers have died in more recent conflicts, both in Northern Ireland and more recently in Afghanistan. Uh, and particularly we remember those who were lost in one incident uh, in Helmand province in August 2009 and whose names are recorded in the chapel behind us. Thank you very much. And now we're going to move uh, away from St. Mary's, not far. It's very much sticking with the theme of uh, remembrance, uh, just down to uh, Church Street, no more than uh, 30 yards, 30, 40 yards. And uh, here's a, an old photo from 1914, which I do like uh, of a of church parade and then here's one from roughly the same place if you just notice in uh, the red circle what's missing because uh, that was the war memorial obviously after the war so uh, it wasn't there when those troops were marching past in 1914 and it's interesting to contemplate how many of those men 
may well be commemorated on the war memorial. In terms of the war memorial itself, it was unveiled on the 10th of July 1921 to a crowd of some 5,000 people. It's a tall slim spire of Portland stone and is in the form of a cross of Eleanor. It includes the arms of Warwick, Leamington, Coventry, Stratford-upon-Avon amongst others. And it also has the symbols of the county of Warwickshire, the Swan of Avon, the Dun Cow, the Bear and Ragged Staff and the Antelope emblem of the Royal Warwickshire uh, Regiment. And on there, we've got the, um, the plaque to the three men that we're remembering today in particular, Sir William Garfield Beach, Alif, Al, Alfred Great Rex Kemp and Percy Hutchinson Reader. And it seems to make sense just to follow those, those men, just really to really finish off this tour. So we're now going to uh, uh, leave poor old William Garfield Beach, who we haven't got a photograph for, uh, who lived at 51 uh, Smith Street, and go from Warwick all the way to, uh, to where he died. All the way, coming in across the island of Imbros, across the Salt Lake, and to Green Hill that we uh, heard about uh, earlier. And there is the Green Hill Memorial, and there is the more memorial plaque to uh, William Beach. And members from the uh, York Warwickshire Yeomanry Museum uh, made this pilgrimage and took these, uh, took these pictures, which I think is really rather touching to show that we do remember these people still. And obviously we've got the Ninth War Royal Warwicks. There's Alfred Kemp with his platoon. And down from the other end uh, of the social spectrum, we've got Percy, Percy Reader. And we're just going to look at uh, where they are uh, commemorated. And you can see up the top of the farm there, at the top of the video, uh, but then fortunately, neither of their bodies were found when they died on the 10th of August in that terrible fighting. So they are commemorated on the Hellas Memorial, rather impressive 100 foot high stone column uh, with the names of some 11,500 men whose uh, remains never found. And this is down at this very southern end tip of Hellas, so that any ship sailing up the Dardanelles, you can see there in the background, can see uh, and hopefully remember those men. So, uh, that is our tour. We've done a distance of some three miles or five kilometres. We've covered in years between nine, um, 900 AD and 1960. Uh, we've commemorated two units and one campaign and three men in particular. I'd uh, strongly recommend that if you're uh, interested in, in anything that we've been talking about today, that there are some excellent museums in Warwick. There's the Fusiliers Museum, the Yeomanry Museum, uh, and of course, some excellent places to visit as well. St John's House, uh, St Mary's Church is fabulous, as our courthouse. And then when the Fusiliers Museum reopens at Pageant House, then uh, I strongly recommend visiting there.